So tonight we are fortunate to have representatives of Caspio with us to talk about the future. Uh, and I'm going to ease into that by giving you a little bit of history. Some of you probably know this. Some of you, well, I think everybody here probably knows this, but Microsoft tried to webify access three different times that I know of. One was in 2000, 2002 with the data access pages. And then in 2010, they came out with the access web databases, which were SharePoint lists and HTML forms that ran both in the browser and on the desktop. And they ended that experiment, launched the access web apps in 2013. And those were pure HTML forms that ran in the browser only with the SQL Azure backend. And I had the good fortune of writing two of the only two books ever written on either web apps or web databases or co-authoring co both of them. So when Power Apps came out in roughly the same time that web app access web apps were deprecated, I sort of pulled my horns in and said, I'm not really gonna look too much further down this road. But over time, it's become clear that somehow being on the web or in the cloud or however you wanna phrase that is an important part of what a lot of people do or want to do. There are lots of options, but one of the more interesting ones I think is the kind of thing that Caspio is doing, which is hosting databases in the cloud. They start with the access database and move it to the cloud. So we're fortunate to have the three representatives here to help us understand how that works and, and what we might look for in doing that. Uh, Microsoft Access is 30 years old this month and Caspio is 22 years old. They have been around 22 years, so they have a long track record as well. And I think that's one of the things that speaks well for, for uh, a company that they, so, you know, we all brag about how long Access has been around, but Caspio has been uh, there for a long time as well. And I think that's something that we all need to be taking some confidence from. So I'm going to make now, um, Ned, find your profile here, make you the presenter. So you okay. can share your screen. Let me give it a go. Uh, Let's try it. Control. Now, typically I like to have presenters sort of introduce themselves and mm -hmm. give a little bit of their background rather than interpret their life history for them. So if you want to, please do that. Yeah, I'll go first. Hey everyone, my name is Ned. I have been with Caspio, well, almost 13 years. I can't even believe it's been that long. Um, my background is mostly in front-end development, so I have a really good understanding of, you know, web development, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, but obviously I know the Caspio platform very well, and hopefully I can impart some of my knowledge to you as well today and maybe help you move some of your access databases to the cloud through a simply just an educational demo today so that you can see how Caspio works and how potentially you might be able to uh, get inspired and maybe at some point, move your access databases um, to the cloud securely. So that's a little bit about me. And I don't know if Nick and Brian, if you want to step yeah. in and introduce yourself as well. Thanks. I'll, I'll just say a quick hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I lead alliances uh, at Caspio and uh, we work with all our partners. Um, George had mentioned that many of you on today's call might be uh, in the consulting space. Uh, we do offer a great program for uh, you know IT and business consultants that allows them to avail of a free developer plan as well as free trainings and certifications on the Caspio platform. And uh, so that's just the reason Brian and I are as well on today's call uh, to kind of you know say hi and that way you have you know whom to reach out to uh, should you be interested in exploring this platform further. Okay, wonderful. Um, so for my presentation today, um, I'm just gonna get into it and let you know what we're gonna be building uh, in today's demo. 
Uh, what I've done ahead of time is I picked this database application that's in Access. It comes with Access database. It's called a bugs tracking application. And it has a few tables inside it. And one thing that you will need to do uh, before you develop your application in Caspio, you will need to split your database. When it comes to importing your Access database into Caspio, it's not a direct import. Uh, the only thing you will need to import are, the only thing that you will be able to import are the tables. Uh, it's still going to preserve all of your field names, all of your data types, but then you will have to recreate the forms and reports. And you will see in just a few minutes how easy it is to build a form in Caspio. There's no coding. We already have the layer underneath, which is the table. We just need to use our point and click framework to build a form in just a minute or two. And then you go live with that form, um, which is going to be either public facing or you can password protect the form and reports all on the web. And you can share that data with your colleagues or anybody else who is collaborating on that project. So many of you are probably familiar, familiar with Access Database button up here. I've already split my database. I already have that database here on my desktop. So here's my file, and we're going to quickly import this file into my account. So I will go ahead and log in. One thing that we do give our customers the ability to do is you can see I can pick from multiple accounts. The benefit of having multiple accounts is that you can use one account for building prototypes and proof of concepts, and you can have a completely separate account for all of your applications that are live or in production. I am going to pick one of my accounts here, log in. And as soon as I log in, I am taken to the home screen. And on the home screen, I will be able to see the list of all of the applications that I have developed as long as I've had my Caspio account. Okay, and it's very easy to begin building an application. You click on this button up here at the top, create an app. And then you're gonna have two options on how you can proceed. You can either start by importing data, which many of us will end up doing because you have those access tables, or if you'd like, you can build your application from a blank template. I'm gonna import my data, very simple. I'm gonna give this application a name. Let's just call this bug tracking. We're gonna locate that file. I have it on my desktop and I just need to find it. Here it is. We're gonna hit next. And now Caspi is going to take me inside the import wizard. Okay, let's hit next. All right, so here are the tables that we just looked at inside Access database. We have all the tables. The two tables that I'm not going to need are the settings and the filters. We don't need to import those two, uh, those two tables. Really what we need are the bugs, the comments, and the users, because the whole premise of this application is for users to be able to log in, report bugs, and be able to view comments that pertain to each of the bugs. We have some options here on the right-hand side. We're gonna create brand new tables. This is, can be your destination object name. You can keep the same table name if you'd like, or you can rename the table to something else. We're gonna hit next. And there is one thing that I actually forgot to mention here. I apologize. Let me cancel out of the import because I don't want to import this inside the all assets container. Just bear with me for a second here. I'll, I will explain this. Um, actually, no, that's my mistake. I already had my bug tracking thing created. I apologize. That is my mistake. Let me go back to configure now. I confused myself a little bit. So we're back in the import wizard. We're going to hit next. And then now we're gonna be able to see the list of all of our tables that we're bringing in. These two we're not importing. Let me make sure we're not importing those tables. Let me deselect them one more time and hit next. And now we don't see those tables anymore. So we can filter to our uh, through our tables. We can see the field names across the top. We can rename those field names to something else. And then we can choose if we wanna import each of the columns. And here you can see how Caspio maintains and preserves all of the data types for me. Uh, one thing that I will check is if we have any unique IDs that we need to change. So for example, this table has a unique ID and I'm just gonna change that to an auto number. So every time a bug is created in this table, we assign a unique ID to that bug. So that's one change that we would have to make. Let's take a look at the comments table. We have a unique ID here as well. We're gonna change that to be an auto number. And then for the users, we also wanna change that to be an auto number. So it's gonna be a relational database where we eventually stamp the user ID into the bugs table when we submit the form. But you will see in just a moment what that looks like. So let's hit import. And it shouldn't take too long. All right. 
So no records were imported. One record failed. We'll find out. So it's just a alert to let me know that something failed to import. I think there might have been a record inside that user table that needs to be looked at. So let's close the screen and let's go inside the application tables now. And we should be able to see all three of those tables. And just like in Access Database, I can now open up my table to view my data. And if I wish to modify my fields, I can go to table design. And from here, I can rename a field to something else. I can add a new field to my table, or I can remove a field if I no longer need that in my database design. One thing that I will add to my users table, since this is gonna be an online application, I will need to add a password field for my table so that later on my users can log in with maybe their username and password credential in order to view the bugs and also submit those bugs. I'm gonna move my password field up. You can see we can reposition that field if needed. So I'll just move that field underneath my username field. For my data type under password, I will make that a password data type. So it's encrypted on the table level. Even if somebody opens up your table, they're never gonna be able to read the password. It's gonna be fully encrypted. For my username, we need to have one unique field. So we're gonna treat the username as one of the login fields. Those are gonna be our credentials. Last name, I don't think the last name for the users needs to be unique. So we're going to uncheck these two fields. Company name does not need to be unique as well. City, these fields don't need to be unique because I imagine that you can have multiple users in this account with the same last name or maybe the first name. Shouldn't be that, that unique. All right, so let's go back to data sheet tab. Let's save our changes. And I'm just going to add some sample users so that later on when we log in, we can test out the application. And I'm going to add these users directly inside my table. And later on, you can also build a form to accomplish the same thing. So why don't we put myself, so NP can be the username. I will put my password to be test. You can see how the password is encrypted. And then we'll just say my first, so this will be my last name. And this will be my first name. I don't need to enter the other fields. You can if you want to later on, but just for the interest of time, let's just have the username listed. And then we're also going to have, why don't we have Linda? And then that can be the username. And then we can use the password test as well. And Linda, I apologize. I don't know your last name. So I'm just going to put sample if that's okay with you. So we'll do Linda sample. And then we're going to save those changes. So now my table has two users. And each user has the username and the password field. What you need to do next is you need to go to the authentications object. Authentications allow us to create that login screen on the web where users input those credentials. So think of it like a layer on top of your reports, an additional layer on top of your form that you need to bypass first before you can access your data. So we're going to set up a new authentication. And we're gonna build this very quickly. So all you need to do is select the user table that contains those credentials. We're gonna use custom for the setup option. You can use express, but I prefer using custom. We're gonna use a standard table or view. And then here are my two login fields, email and password. Okay, and that's all you need to do. Just scroll down a little bit, hit on create. And we're gonna call this BT for bug tracking user login. And that is my login screen, which we're going to apply in just a moment once we build the form. So to build all the interfaces, just like you wouldn't access all the forms, all the reports, Caspia calls them data pages. Okay. Personally, I like to call them widgets because when you build a data page or a widget, eventually you're going to deploy that to the web. So your end user can access the forms and access the data. We're going to create a new data page. And this is going to launch Caspio's point and click data page wizard. And this is Caspio's secret sauce, if you will. Using the point and click method that we have here is what gives us the ability to build applications 20 times faster than using traditional development. So if I wanted to build that submission form to submit a bug, I will select this option. But keep in mind that you can also build update forms. We can do password recovery forms. We have reports. Let me zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see. We have reports, and these are just different layouts. We can do tabular reports, which has rows and columns. We have gallery, we have list. We even have pivot tables. If you're looking to do uh, more calculations and aggregate your data, uh, we can do calendars. 
So if your application contains, let's say, events or appointments, you can display those appointments on a monthly calendar or a weekly calendar, um, which would make it easier for either your customers or somebody else to create the appointment. It just depends on the application. Uh, we can build charts for KPIs and metrics and to analyze trends. So many different charts that you can create for your application if you'd like. But for now, we're going to select submission form. We're going to select this option, hit next. And now we need to select the data source. In other words, when I submit the form, where do I want that data to go? So I will select my bugs table, okay? Because I'm trying to create a new bug. Let's give it a name. We're going to call this very simple, um, submit a new bug. So this is for our eyes only. Uh, when it comes to styling, we give you some preloaded styles that you can choose from. Each style has its own color palette. Styles are all about the aesthetics, the look and feel of your form. So if you want to change the color of the labels, color of the buttons, fields, you can apply a specific style. I'm going to choose blue. Localization is all about regional settings. So let's say you're deploying this form to a German speaking audience. Uh, you can choose that localization and then it's going to translate the form to that specif uh, specific localization or that region. You can also change the date format even the currency, if you'd like. I am going to stick with English because that is the language that I speak. <laughs> and now we need to restrict access to our end user. Okay, so this is very important. We check the box and now we can choose that authentication object that we created right over here. And when you apply this object to your form, now the form is going to be password protected and the end user needs to input the username and password before they can view the form. We're gonna hit next. It's asking me, what fields do you wish to use in the web form? So if I log in and I want to see these fields, I can select assign to. Maybe I can assign this bug to a specific user in my table. I can choose priority, category. I think I'll probably need most of these project status, open by, open date, due date, keywords. I don't know if I'm going to need all these fields. I didn't really investigate the application too much. So we're going to put maybe resolution, resolve version and hit next. Once you reach the properties section, here you can select your fields on the left-hand side and you can make modifications to your fields using the form element dropdown. And you can see a slew of options here on how you can modify each field. So for example, assign to, if I want to create a dropdown, I can choose dropdown. I can do custom values and lookup tables. So I usually like to choose both because under custom values, I like to say select employee, we're going to delete the value because we're not really choosing that. Okay, that just needs to be a blank value. And then for lookup table, we're going to choose our table of users. I'm going to choose the username. So I want to be able to view Linda's name or her username because I'm trying to assign this bug to her. But in the, in the table, it's actually going to stamp her ID in the bugs table, okay, in the background. And I'm also going to be able to see myself because I want to be able to maybe assign that bug to myself. For priority, unfortunately, I don't have lookup tables. It's much easier to build dropdowns uh, when you have lookup tables because when I select priority and I choose dropdown, you can see I don't have a lookup table of priorities. I only have these three tables, but I could build a lookup table that contains that. So if I choose dropdown, I'm going to choose custom values and I can just say select priority. And then you can say maybe urgent. Um, well, it's another priority that we can medium or something like that or low for priority. So I'm just creating my own custom values and make sure you delete the value for the top option. Okay. And then you could have category, you can have project, you could have status, you can have open by. So open by as the user that's logged in, in this case, I'm going to log in as myself. What I need to do is make this field hidden because I don't need to see that. I'm going to make that field hidden. And using the authentication object, I can stamp my user ID in the bugs table. Okay, so it's a hidden field. I'm logged in as Ned. When I submit the form, it's going to stamp my ID because I'm the one who opened up that bug and I assigned that bug to a specific user in, from the, within the same table, essentially. We have open date. Uh, we can have a calendar pop-up. You'll see what that looks like in just a moment. Uh, due date, keywords. If you'd like to assign keywords, why don't we make that a text area? Actually, 
I cannot make this a text area because I'm using text 255 data type. Summary, same thing, resolution, uh, if it was fixed. So why don't we create that to maybe be maybe radio button? Uh, and we'll just say fixed, I don't know, pending, open, or something like that. And we can choose uh, from one of the radio button options. So I think I'm okay with that. Let's go ahead and save our changes. And just like that, I was able to build my form. To see the form, we can hit preview. And it's going to ask me to log in. So why don't we log in as me? I am one of the users. My password is test. I can log in. And here's the form. Okay. So now I can select the employee. We see Linda. We see myself. I can assign this to, let's say, Linda, uh, priority, urgent, category, um, outlook is broken. I don't know. Something like that. Project. You can have any fields you want in that table to be displayed on the form. You can choose a status, open date, today, due date, maybe end of month. Keywords that you can add if you'd like to be able to later on search on those keywords. Uh, why don't we just put Outlook as one of the keywords. Summary fixed, let's just say open. And I'm not really sure the meaning of that label on that field. But now I can hit submit. Okay, so that was the preview to be able to see the form from within Caspio. If I wanted to publish that form to the web, we hit deploy, we enable deployment status, and then Caspio gives us four different deployment methods. The embed model is the most popular. All you need to do is copy the snippet of code and paste that code into your own website. Now, I know that sounds like a steep learning curve, and it was for me too when I first started developing websites, but if you're familiar with using Webflow or maybe WordPress or GoDaddy or Wix or Weebly, these are all point and click website builders. You don't need to be a developer. So if you're, as long as you know how to build even a decent looking website in less than an hour, let's just say, you create some space on your website where you plan on embedding this form. And now this form will seamlessly embed into that part of your website and live on that page for as long as you have that deploy code embedded. If you don't have a website, you can publish the form using a direct URL link. So this is uh, hosted through Caspio. If I copy the link and hit close here, I can share this link with all of us in today's chat. So if I, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to click on that link in the chat, but if you can do me a favor, if you just click on that link, go ahead and just sign in on your end. Uh, and you can use my username, Ned P or Linda S or Linda. I think the username is just Linda. Log in with the password test and just submit something. Don't submit any personal information, just fictitious submission, just something arbitrary. Uh, please uh, submit it. And then let me know when you're done in the chat window. And then we're going to take a look and see the data uh, inside the table. And I apologize for putting you to work, but I think it's more fun to make it interactive. So. <laughs> I don't think any of the fields are required. I think all the fields are optional. I should have made the, the two drop downs required, but that's okay. And if you're not able to see the form, just let me know. Uh, you can unmute yourself or. You can also unmute yourself to let me know if you're done. You don't have to submit it via the chat. I think maybe there's an issue with assign to. It's, Is there? Uh, it's yeah. not allowing Linda. On my I end. forgot my password. It's not oh, it, it's test. It's test. The password is I test. I thought it was test. I, yeah. I wasn't sure. It's not accepting either you or Linda as the assigned to. Yeah. As the assigned to? You must yeah, it says... So oh, the value I, is already present. Yeah, sorry. I made that field unique. So that's that's my mistake. I just need to go back to my table and do that. Because it's a one-to-many relationship. Sorry. That cannot be a unique field. Now, you should be able to. It's a one-to-many. Sorry. So when a user logs in, they can be linked to multiple bugs. So. And now it's submitted. Great. Oh, wait. Well, I'm back. I'm still seeing an error message at the top that says values of one or more fields are invalid. And the note at the bottom is value already pre present. Yeah, so this one here as well. So that's my mistake. I should have looked at this table ahead of time. Uh, that's actually my mistake. I This is the unique key here. This is the primary key, but these two are going to be um, not a unique field. So they are foreign keys. So 
please do me a favor and just look at the form one more time. You should now be able to successfully submit. Um, and I'm also going to make the keywords not be. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. And now I'm seeing all the submissions come in and you can see uh, all of us are located. I'm here in California. You could be in a different country, different state. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. As long as you have access to that link, you can always log in, submit the form and be able to see. Um, well, we're going to build that data page next where you, can, you get to see all of the submissions as well, not just the form. Okay. So which takes me to my next data page that we're going to create. So now we know how to build a form. The next thing we're gonna create is a very simple report. And let's maybe go with the tabular format, okay? We're gonna select that option so that we can output the data from the same bugs table, okay? We're gonna call this uh, manage bugs. Let's select the style, maybe blue. Localization is still going to be English. Restrict access to the user because you don't want to expose those bugs to somebody else who is looking at that report. So you always have to sign in to make it secure. So now you're going to see a couple of different configuration screens when we when it comes to building reports. It's slightly different when it, when it comes to building forms. Uh, we can choose now if we want to have a search form. I want the results to appear below the search form. And I want to display the results on the initial load, meaning when the report loads, you see the search form on the top and you see the data underneath the search form and you can filter down further if needed. If you're only interested in seeing your own bugs that are assigned to you, we have something called record level security. Okay, that means that each user when they log in will be able to see just the bugs that are assigned to their unique ID. Okay, so let's skip that for now. Let's leave that open, hit next. And now what fields do you wish to use in the search form to filter the data? So let's search based on, well, let's take a look. Let's search based on, we had some priorities. So we can search based on that field. Um, what else did I have? I had, we can also do a date range. So why don't we do that? Uh, let's do open date. So you can see a date range. Um, I had category, but I forgot what categories I used, I think. And why don't we maybe search based on who the bug was assigned to? Okay, we're going to hit next. For priority, I had, so I need to recreate my dropdown. It would be much easier if I had a lookup table, but because I don't have a lookup table, I always have to create these custom values. So we're going to say search any priority. Make sure you delete the value. And then my priorities were low, medium, and urgent. My memory still works. <laughs> For open date, to create a date range, we have to use this button here, and then we're going to insert new criteria, which creates two additional fields underneath the open date field. We're going to use the logical operator to be and, and then for criteria one, it's going to be greater than or equal to, and then I always like to just modify my label slightly to save from. And then criteria two is going to be less than or equal to, and just modify my label to say that. Assign to, why don't we create this to be a dropdown? Okay, we're gonna use both because I have a user table and we're gonna say search any. So it returns all of the users. And then for lookup table, we're gonna link back to our user table and simply just select the username. So I would like to be able to pull all the bugs that have been assigned to Linda or myself. Let's hit next. And now it's asking me, what fields do you wish to use in the results page? So when you're looking at your data and I selected my tabular report, why don't we go ahead and see who the bug is assigned to? Maybe the comments. We can look at priority, category, project status. Let's just have a couple of these fields. The rest of the fields we can include in the details view. These are gonna be inside a results page. Let's continue. Now, if you'd like the ability to edit your data directly from the results page, you can enable that using these checkboxes. For now, I'm just gonna keep everything read only. But you as the user, if you want the capability to delete entries, you can enable inline delete or maybe even bulk delete. You can do inline edit. Let's enable inline edit just so you can see what that looks like. Let's continue. 
So this is my results page fields. I'm not going to make any changes to my results page. Let's just continue. Let's display 25 records per page by default. You can also sort the data. So if you have a date that's stamped and you want to sort the data, for example, open by date, and you want to see the most recent bug submission first, you can sort the data. Let's hit next. And now you can choose if you want to see a details page or if you want to disable a details page. Let's enable the details page and decide what fields we want to move into the details view. Just to keep things simple, let's move all the fields into the details view. Hit next one final time. And now you can choose to make modifications to your details fields. Just like on the submission form, I can select my fields here on the left-hand side. So if I want the ability to edit comments, I can turn that into a text area. If I want to create this to be a dropdown again, so directly from my report, if I want to reassign that bug to somebody else, I could create that to be a dropdown. I could link that back to my table of users and I can select the username. And this is going to allow me to reassign that bug to somebody else. Keep in mind that in Caspio, you can have different levels of permissions for all of your users. So you could have an admin level access, you have supervisors, you could have employees. And depending on who you are, when you log into the application, you're going to have a different set of permissions. For example, the admin level user has the ability to edit, while the employee level user does not have the ability to do that. Maybe they just have read-only rights. So when done, we're going to hit finish. I will just hit preview just to see what it looks like. And here is my report. So now I can search based on priority. Okay. Uh, we have, let's see if it works. We have one, two, three urgent. So if I select urgent and I filter, it should return just those three. If I select any, which has a blank value, it should return everything. So we reset it. Assign to. So if I just want to see the ones that have been assigned to Linda, I can select her name, hit search, and it's going to filter all of those bugs. And I think I only have one that's been assigned to me maybe. Yeah. Okay. Let's return all. I can do an inline edit. So if I wanted to quickly maybe change this uh, priority, I can do an inline edit and I can create this to be a dropdown as well, but I can change this to maybe low. It's not that urgent after all. Hit update and there's my update. I can also go to details and from the details page, I can edit the comments and I can reassign that bug to somebody else. So I will share the link. So let's go ahead and just hit deploy. And I'll just give you a minute to take a look at the report on your end as well, so you can try it out. And one thing that I recommend to people, if you're using a direct link deployment method, so let me close the chat. So if you use the direct link deployment method, what you can do, you can instruct the end user and let them know, hey, just bookmark the links. If you bookmark those links, you can always access the application. Okay, because they're saved to your browser. You can click on the link, you can log in, and you, have, you gain access to all of the functionality, especially if you're not embedding into your own website. I don't know if I mentioned iframe and .NET. iframe is another way of embedding. And then we have .NET. If you have a SharePoint environment, uh, you can use the .NET code to embed into SharePoint. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, comments, thoughts. Um, hopefully, you had a chance to look at the report on your end. Just, um, does Caspio mean you have to recreate your entire application? Uh, not the tables, but you do have to recreate the forms and reports. So, so for a complicated, I mean, I have some very, very complicated access applications. This would not work. There's no yeah. way of doing extensive be visual basic code or any of that. Yeah, you're correct. So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have that, um, so I don't know the I don't know the complexity of the applications, unfortunately, in your end. I, I imagine some of them are extremely complex. And I I can empathize fully because I've seen some very complex um, access databases with VBA and I would have to look at, I mean, I, unfortunately I would have to see what you've done to see if it's feasible or not. But I I, I, I completely you. trust you when you say it, because you can you can evaluate your own application and you can see uh, no, the pros and cons. And it would require extensive VBA programming. Right. And I, I would also have to reprogram everything. So I'm not sure this makes sense for most of my customers. Can, I, can I make a comment and ask a question? Yeah. Uh, 
yesterday I did my Power Apps presentation for Collins Group in Europe. And one of the things that struck me about this approach is that it really works well if there's a relatively low code segment of an application that needs to be mobile in a browser. But the back the, the bulk of the application needs to be in Linda's complex desktop application. And I think that's kind of the hybrid model that I would think of. Is that possible with with Caspio? Can you go down that road? So one thing that you could do is you can make maybe some of your forms available online. We do provide a plugin that streams streamlines the submission. So if you submit something via the web, you can have that data also be stored in your access database locally, but it's a one-way street. It's not two-way. So if you make some of your forms available online for mobile, because all of our forms are responsive, um, as um, mentioned, then you could uh, potentially have users submitting and looking at some bits and pieces of data and then have your data be submitted back locally to your uh, much, much more sophisticated database to do other processing if needed. I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully I understood that comment and question. Yeah, yeah I, I realize that that's kind of a different way to look at it, but I kind of think that the hybrid model where, where those functions, which belong in a complex desktop environment stay there, but those functions which lend themselves to well, I'll, I'll use the word in the cloud or mobile, should be available to somebody who is not at their desk in the office. And, and, and this particular one where we're looking at bugs may not be that, but I think there are lots of applications where that is possible, where you can say, I've got people working in the warehouse looking up inventory mm -hmm. and submitting reports back through this interface on what's on the shelf. And since it's a one-way street, that's going to record into the desktop application. I, th I think that kind of what I, oh, I'm just getting a, a reminder that I get excited and I move my mouth away from the microphone and nobody can hear me anymore. But I, again, I'm, I'm going on and on, but I, I kind of think that that hybrid approach makes sense in the world we're living in today. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, there are a lot of use cases um, for that type of a scenario. I will just mention one thing here on the table level. We can do automation in the uh, behind the scenes using our triggered actions. Uh, we use a Blockly framework for that, where we can add different actions based on insert, update, or delete on the table level. Um, and because you brought up the inventory, I'm going to use that as the example. Uh, so say, for example, you have an e-commerce system on the web and somebody placed an order for something let's say quantity of 10, uh, we could have that number 10 be subtracted from the table uh, automatically behind the scenes. And then in addition to that, we could have a checkbox to be checked to put that item on back order uh, if the threshold fall falls maybe below 20%. And to combine with that, you can also maybe trigger an email to be sent to the admin level user to notify him or her, hey, inventory is at a certain percentage, go ahead and add more to the uh, table so more people can buy that item. Um, a very powerful feature to um, do a lot of processing in the back end automatically uh, without you having to do manual intervention. So I, 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 my mind goes in all kinds of scattered directions. So rein me back in if I'm getting too far off topic. Mm -hmm. uh, that implies you have some sort of robust database engine back there? Yeah. Absolutely. So this is, um, it's called a Blockly framework. Um, and we integrated this with the Caspio platform to allow procedures on the back end, to automate the procedure on the back end. So to have tables, essentially to have tables talk to each other. Um, I'll give you one more, maybe a little bit of more of a simple example. If you have a history log table, and let's say you're making updates to one of your tables. As soon as you make an update, you can have that be copied to your history log table simultaneously. So now you have a history of all the logs for the updates that you've made on a specific account. I know I have this example in one of my applications, but I don't know exactly, and I don't want to spend too much time looking for that application. Um, 
But the idea here, if I can just quickly replicate what I'm talking about, let me just don't, let me see if I can try it. I will make a copy or a duplicate of this table. And let's just do table design only. And we're going to call this bugs history log. Okay, I need to have an underscore for my tables here. Sorry. So let me see if I can quickly try to conjure something up here. So we'll create a duplicate of that table. So inside this table now for bugs history, um, let's see. We can, yeah, we can include the ID that's fine, assign to integer ID. Okay, this lo all looks okay. Let's go back to the main table of bugs, click on triggered actions. So the idea now here on this table of bugs is to, upon insert or update, so if I insert something and update something inside the bugs table, I also want to insert those changes inside the bugs history table, okay? Um, and then what we're going to do here is click on the gear icon to select from the inserted table. You can do conditional with the where clause. We're not going to do anything conditional if then type, for example, only copy the data to the bugs history log table if something else happens to another table. But we're going to remove the where clause and we're going to just slide that over to the trash can and let go. And the final step here is really just to map out the fields from both the uh, bugs table and the history table. So you can include all of your fields if you'd like. And then you go to data, move over the field, snap that in place and assign to will be to assign to. And now there's a little bit of a faster way of doing this. If you right click, oh, I thought there was a way to make a copy of this. Maybe I'm mistaken. Oh, let me see. Yeah, you duplicate and you snap it in place. And then you just map out comments to comments. And I'm not gonna do all of these. I'm just gonna do a few. So priority to priority. And let's do category to category. And since I have actually project and that will stop right there. And now let's save and let's give this a name. So we're gonna call this copy data to history log table or something like that. Save and enable. Let's go to our tables and let's add a new bug to our bugs table. So if I add assign to three comments uh, and a, ID, that's the auto number urgent. And we went all the way up until project category, um, access and project zoom. So as soon as I save my changes to the bugs table in my history log table, that should be recorded as well. Outstanding. Okay. And if I make an update to my bug, so if I go back to my other table now, and let's just say, um, this is no longer urgent. Maybe this is low, zoom, maybe WebEx. And I save that change. The expected behavior is to now create a new log. So you still maintain the original submission, but you're just tracking the submissions for that specific ID. That's the idea. So that's what the trigger does. And this is a very simple example of a trigger. You can do much more complicated and complex configurations with triggered actions. Um, and I know I'm doing everything on a table level, uh, but this would make for a much more better presentation if I built my data pages around this and I was able to look at my data pages and see the history for a specific bug all on the web and not just here behind the scenes on the table level. To be honest, most of us who are access developers want to see your tables. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so then in that case, you will feel at home if I go to the relationship screen here, which mimics how Axis does it. So if I go to app relationships and I include my user table, my comments table and my bugs table, we can move these table around. They're floating tables. You can expand and collapse. Just like in Axis, same idea. Here's my other table. So we know that one user can open up many bugs. So let me just move things around a little bit. So this is my unique ID. We're gonna stamp that into the open by. That's a one to many. So we have a pop-up here. Caspi immediately identified that as a one-to-many relationship. You can enforce referential integrity as well. Referen referential integrity is very useful. So if I enforce, that basically means that I am not allowed to delete a parent record if that parent record has child entries in the related table. So that enforces referential integrity between these two tables. And I can hit create. 
We also know that one user can have many comments, right? So I can just come over here and stamp the user ID into my comments table. And that's also a one to many. So eventually this starts to look like a giant spider web if you have a lot of tables. I have done a lot of videos on our YouTube channel talking about database design. Uh, some of my examples include 20 to 25 tables, uh, but that's only, I don't go beyond that because I don't want to overwhelm people. But just like in Access, you can do one-to-one, -one, you can do one-to-many, and you can do many-to-many -many via third table um, in your database design. I have a, another question if I can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, this is something that uh, George brought up, but so in terms of, of making a hybrid, Mm -hmm. What, um, and you, you started to mention it, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on it. What um, uh, uh, access do we have to, uh, I understand that basically these tables are being stored on a Caspio server. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So do we, would, is there a way for us to have, um, when something is updated there, that we have access to it, you know, like, a, you know, that we could pull that data down and view it uh, in um, a local desktop version of Access. Yeah, a couple of ways you can do that. Let me just make sure if I go to tables here, let me just save my design. And let's just say we wanted to export my bugs table. Yeah, there's the Access database file here. You can export it back to your desktop or uh, you he can... He doesn't want to export it. He wants, he wants live... Uh, access to it. Right. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So this is one option. This is um, export to desktop, but if you want to sync with your local access database automatically, we do have a plugin. Let me see if I can move this zoom. Let sync, me come over here. that was the word I was looking for, sync it. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can find it. And if um, Nick, you can find it maybe a little bit faster than me if you, if you can search on your end as well. I'm just going to go to our how-to and see if I can find it very quickly here. Plugin. I think I found that's what we would use to make a, a hybrid is that, you know, that people can enter it using the Caspio interface on the web and enter stuff in there. But then in, in the office where they have a desktop with a more complex and other, other stuff, they would be able to see that in their local access database. And gotcha. then also it can, would it be a two way street that if something was entered in the local access database, can it be synced up? So that is something that we cannot do. It's a one-way street. So it's only from Caspio to Access. It's not the other. So that's what the plugin, this plugin here that I'm showing you will allow you to do. Um, and it's a very, very simple install. I'm, I should have done this for you guys ahead of time. I apologize. I didn't no. think about doing this. No. Uh, but if you install the plugin, it's installed directly into your Access database. And you just put in your Caspio credentials within Access. And then when the table is updated in Caspio, that same data is available in your local file as well. So we can receive data yeah. from the Caspio site. We just can't send stuff to it. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So Question. originally you started, you did an import into, into Caspio. Is there any kind of bulk way you could do that on a timer or, or something? Yeah. Uh, so we do have a feature. Uh, that's called data import and export. So it's our data hub feature. Let me see if this will work. So if we schedule an import, uh, let's import and let me just create a new site. So one way to do that, if you have an online repository, uh, FTP or Dropbox, this is the only way to do it on a timer, uh, set a frequency. But if you have, let's say a Dropbox account or a Google Drive or OneDrive, and if you have some way of sending your access tables to Dropbox, um, then you can have Caspio log in securely to your Dropbox account and fetch that data and append that data to your existing tables in Caspio. So and you can set the frequency. Unfortunately, uh, let me see if I maybe can authorize my Dropbox account here. So now I'm giving Caspio access to my Dropbox account. I will hit allow. And let me see if I have anything here. Uh, suggestions, my files. So maybe I can move that bugs database so we can test this out. Let me see if, I mean, I haven't done this in a little while, so let's give it a go and just try it. Let me just move this here. Um, let's go to my Dropbox account here. I can attest to the dangers of live demos. 
Ah, yes. <laughs> so we'll just move this bug. Well, let's actually, let's see if we can. I was going to, I was hoping to add something to this table here directly and save it. Uh, if I can. Okay, well, let me just show you how it works. Um, so the idea then would be to move that file to Dropbox. Okay, there's my file. And then in Caspio, choose that file. Hopefully I can see it here. There it is, choose. Okay, we're gonna hit next. So it's the same idea. So you can choose what tables you want to append. I'm gonna disable these two tables and then we have append to your table. So if you have new data, uh, you can just append that to your existing tables. Okay, we're gonna map out the fields, I believe on the next page. So here we can map out the fields. Um, I'm not gonna make any changes here. I'm gonna keep that the way it is. And then on the, uh, on the subsequent screen here, we can now set the frequency, how often you want Caspio to go to Dropbox, find that data and append it. So that's the frequency uh, that we have enabled here in the, in the wizard. And usually customers do like to do that at midnight when people are asleep to fetch the data and make it available in the morning for their end users. And then you will simply click finish and then it will be synced up. So in, 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 when, in, go ahead. when you, uh, a couple of screens back, you, you chose a pen, but there was replace was in there as well. Is that replace the entire table or what is that? That will replace the entire table, correct. So you can kind of visualize where you might have some data that you wanted to live on the cloud that didn't have to be immediately uh, current. Mm -hmm. And you could, uh, you know, export out access to a table in your Dropbox, have it grab here, and then it would come down the other way through that, that plugin. So yep. you wouldn't want to replace Linda's entire application, but there may be por portions within that mm -hmm. make sense to be on the web that uh, you could visualize a pathway that that would happen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a very good point. And we also have update down here as well, which finds the record through a unique ID. Uh, so yeah. that's also a very useful one. And if we were to replace the table, the, the, the forms that were built on it would still work. Yes, yes. As, well, as long as the fields are the same. Right, right. As long as the, yeah, correct. Great. Yeah, so, so. And one other thing that I will mention here, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to show you everything on Caspio. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. But here under, the, uh, under access permissions, if you're collaborating and if you need additional developers to your Caspio account, not on the front end, on the web, on the application side, this is more on the Caspio side, the developers. You could add other users to your account. We give you unlimited developers. So if Linda wanted to collaborate with George and Jack, you know, you all three of you can be logged into Caspio and work on these applications. All you need to do is just send an invite. So if I just put maybe sample at test.com, I have some groups predefined with their own permissions. So if I place this user in my admin group and hit invite, they'll just need to check the email. Sometimes I like to set the permissions on the user level. And you'll see what that looks like in just a second. So if I wanted to give this user access to a certain application in my account, here's my bug tracking application. These are the group's permissions, but I can override those permissions with the checkboxes on the left. Uh, you can also get down to a granular level. So if you expand the tables, uh, here you can give that full control on that table. Or if I only want you to be able to read the data, I will select this checkbox here. Okay, very useful if you have a large team that all need to be logged in at the same time. If you have developers who would also like to gain access to the application development side, uh, just wanted to point and highlight that as well. So, so that implies version control? So version control on the app side, we don't have today, unfortunately. The way around it is to make a copy of the application. So for this bug tracking, what I typically like to do is just make a copy of it 
and y'all just put V1 or V2. Okay. Well, that's very much what we do with access. So that's yeah. Not, not a... So are there any other questions? Uh... Yeah, I've got one more. You, you've been showing us a web uh, interface. Does it have a mobile interface as well? Yes. So all of the forms and reports that you create are automatically responsive. So they're completely web-based. Unfortunately, we don't have the capability for native for the iTunes store and Android. But if you build these reports, let's just say I hit preview on this one. So we built a tabular report, but if I change the width of the browser, you will see how all of the components will conform to fit that viewport of the window. So it goes into a list view. This becomes the search form. You can close it. Just imagine you're on a mobile and you can use your thumb to click on these buttons. And then when you're on the desktop, it becomes a tabular report. And that's managed. When you build the data page, you will see one of the options here is to make it responsive. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Let me just close my demo with the views. In Axis, they're called queries. Caspio calls them views, which just allows you to join tables and you can use those tables in your data pages. So if you need to be able to see data from multiple tables, you link them using the primary key and the foreign key and then use display fields from multiple tables inside the view. And you can also use the views and drop downs as well when you're creating forms and reports. Well, we're, we're getting close to the hour. Uh, are there any other questions that you have? Is there a grid of pricing on your website or how does that work? Yeah, uh, yeah so Oops, almost, caspio.com. And I will let Nick talk a little bit about that. But if you go to a pricing, you'll be able to see uh, all the different pricing plans that we have. And I would say the biggest, if you ask me the biggest differentiator when it comes to building apps, are number of data pages that you can develop per plan. Okay, so today we created and deployed two, but you can see how many you can get on each plan when it comes to forms, reports, charts, and all the other interfaces that you can develop. So the data page is the, the user interface as opposed to the table. Okay. Correct, correct. So you have unlimited tables. In fact, all the other objects here, you have unlimited. You can build as many as you want. What we limit you on are the number of data pages. Now I will mention one last thing. We only count the number when you hit, when you, uh, select this option to enable deployment, that's when it starts counting towards that number up here on the pricing page, okay? You can still have up to five times more inside your account. If you're just previewing, building a prototype, you can still develop up to 100 data pages on this plan, but you can only deploy up to 20. So, so, that's so really just to play around, you, you got a free account that you can do five interfaces on. So yeah, you get a free account with five data pages. Today we built two. So you could take advantage of the free plan and see how much you can get done on the five data pages and deploy those five data pages, correct? Right, and this is where I'll, I'll also chime in. So um, you know, this is where I wanted to just uh, give a shout out to our partner program. So uh, I mean, there's two routes here. One is if you're thinking of this as a purchase for your own use, uh, or say you're working at a, yeah, a company and you want to use it for their their use, then of course you would go via the pricing page and um, you know, uh, sign up as a customer. But on the other hand, if you're a consultant and looking at using this for your clients, then you can sign up as a partner. And uh, Ned, if I can share my screen for just a yeah. quick minute, uh, you can sign up as a partner and then you can avail of our developer plan for free. And this is a comprehensive, it's, it's like one of our uh, paid uh, enterprise grade plans. Um, you, you get all the functionality that, you know, uh, our most powerful enterprise plan has. And, uh, you know, so I'll share this link here in the chat. Uh, and there is no, uh, no fee to sign up as a partner. It's completely free, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and you also get free training and free certifications. Um, and so Brian and I uh, would be happy to, uh, you know, uh, if you were interested, you could sign up here and we would be happy to walk you through the benefits of the program and answer any questions that you might have. Okay. So earlier I put your email addresses in the chat. So if you want to follow up, 
scroll to the top of the chat window. Uh, Nick, Brian, and Ned's uh, email addresses are all in the chat. And I'll give you a minute to, to look for that. So if we become a partner, then basically we will be um, bringing uh, our clients that we're doing consulting to, to you, and they would be the ones that do the, the sign up and paying for the, the account. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's correct. And by the way, there is another benefit from uh, that I completely forgot, which is that as a partner, you also get uh, commissions uh, on uh, clients that you bring into Caspio that start at 20% and uh, go uh, up from there. Uh, now, of course, if should you wish to pass that on as a you know to the your end client, that's entirely up to you. Uh, you know, that's your choice in, in terms of what you want to do. Are there any other questions or comments before we go? Well, I want to thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, as I started out by saying, uh, we're in a kind of a different world today. The, 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 cloud and I'm doing the little air quotes here with the cloud is a is a much more significant part of what we're doing these days and so it's important for us to know what our options are and if, if this is something that fits your business model or your client model as a consultant I think it's a, a, a an excellent option to, to look at to uh, especially now i was not aware of the ability to do the data transfer back and forth which really opens up that aspect of it in a way that some people might not have been aware of and i think that's a good a good thing about it so i was just saying because because we're in the world where a lot of clients that we work with are looking towards the mobile the cloud as an alternative to their traditional access uh, databases, I think it's important for us to have something like Caspio in our toolkit that we can satisfy those needs to, for that mobile browser-based experience. And that's really all I was trying to say. Did that come through? Yeah. Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay. Good. And I mean, I would just piggyback on what, what Nick said about the developer account. I mean, it's no compromise. It's a sandbox account. It's unlimited features and everything. You can build as much as you want. Obviously, it's not for commercial use, but um, the freedom to build whatever you want, test it out, you know, demo it to your clients. It's definitely something I would take advantage of personally. Instead of the free plan. Free plan is nice. You can use it, of course, but the developer account has all the bells and whistles for you to test and proof your applications as much as you need to. So on that note, thank you again for, yeah. for joining us. I, we appreciate the information. I will see you all next month. Thank you all Thanks. as well. Thanks. Thank you. Have Thanks a good a night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you.